My name is Kelly Swift and I am a biologist here at Zion National Park. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about one species, well one group of animals we have here in Zion that are a little bit tricky to study and what we're doing to try and observe them. But firstly I would like to say welcome to Zion National Park. I am standing here in the Zion Canyon Scenic Drive. I have behind me features well known like the Oregon. I have the Great White Throne a little bit behind me. If I were to go northwest I have Angels Landing. To the northeast I have Observation Point. So I am surrounded by some really, really beautiful, tall cliffs. Additionally, I have the Virgin River flowing along behind me as well, the river that formed this canyon. And I'm truly just standing in an oasis, a land that has wonderful habitat, wonderful landscapes to look at, but also wonderful places for lots of plants and animals to live. Along the canyon bottom here, we have habitat for many species like our deer, our gray fox, ringtails, squirrels. The trees and all the greenery provide great habitat for lots of birds, migrating birds this time of year. And these tall cliffs are wonderful habitat for lots of birds like our peregrine falcons, California condor. But there's also one group of animals that also takes advantage of these tall cliffs and canyons behind me and those are our bats. Now when a lot of people think of bats, typically people think of environments more along caves and mines, dark environments, damp environments, but bats actually live in a lot of different places. They live above ground, they can roost in trees, they can roost in lots of man-made structures like bridges and buildings, and bats also love to roost, which means they love to stay in, cracks and crevices in rocks. And that's where Zion makes really great habitat because along these 2,000 foot tall cliffs, we have a lot of cracks and crevices where bats can live. Now let's back up a moment. What is a bat? A bat is a mammal, which means it has hair like us. It gives birth to live young, which are called pups and the females of this species produce milk. Bats are also the only mammals to achieve true flight. There are mammals that can glide, like flying squirrels, but only bats can truly fly. Bats are nocturnal, and bats also can echolocate. See, bats are up at night, which means that it's a little bit hard to see. Bats are not blind, they actually can see, but they rely on echolocation to find their way a little bit better in the dark. Now echolocation, what does that word mean? What is echolocation? If we break down that word to echo, to locate, we all know what an echo is. Everyone when you're a kid probably went to the top of a big hill and yelled across the hill and heard your echo, heard the hills call back to you the words you just said. Well, what bats do is they let out a very loud, and very high pitch call. And when I say high pitch, I mean that they're letting out a call that's at such a high frequency that the human ear is not able to actually hear that sound at all. It's so high frequency. It's actually something called ultrasound. And they let out these ultrasound calls in repeated motions. They're actually waves letting out one after another. And when these high pitch loud waves meet an object, maybe they meet the other side of the canyon wall, maybe they meet a prey item like a moth, that call echoes off of that item back into the bat's ears. So they are actually listening to their echoes to locate an item. Now bats, because they're nocturnal, because they're small, in brown and most bats look pretty similar when they're in flight it's actually a little bit hard to directly observe a bat you might see a bat flying around but that doesn't mean you know what species it is you can't really tell a lot from a bat just by looking at it flying in the sky and additionally it's hard to see bats flying in the sky because they're up at night flying high so that's where this echolocation can actually offer a really unique way to study bats because not only do bats echolocate, but each species of bat has a slightly different echolocation call from another species. 
So if you think of birds, every bird has a slightly different call. A robin doesn't sound the same as a canyon wren. A canyon wren doesn't sound the same as a peregrine falcon. A peregrine falcon doesn't sound the same as a barn owl. Every bird has a unique call and so does every bat. And now while these calls are at very high frequencies that we can't hear, scientists are able to deploy specialized microphones like this one behind me. Behind me, I'm standing with a little PVC pole on my truck. And at the top of this PVC pole is a little red box about the size of a small cracker, maybe about one inch tall by two inches wide at most. And inside this microphone, sorry, inside this is a specialized microphone, which is made to listen to these ultrasound echolocation calls. And because every call is unique for each species, what we can do is we can take these microphones outside, record them, record the calls, take those calls, put them in a computer and analyze it. And now we can understand what bats are flying around at night based off of their calls. It's pretty cool to be able to listen to something that we shouldn't be able to hear thanks to technology. Now there's two main ways that you can listen to bats using these really fancy, simple microphones. You can go out into a field, maybe into this area here where there's lots of bat habitat all around. There's the river behind me where the bats might go and feed. You can set up this microphone and we can leave it playing all night long. Maybe if it has a good enough battery, we can leave it playing for four nights in a row. We can take that data process that data and we can get a list of all the bat calls and hopefully what species each call is. Now we have data. Now we have information about our bats and we can start analyzing that to understand the story of what these bats are doing. Now that's a really great way to study bats. However, this method, which we call stationary sampling because you're just staying in one place, has one pitfall and that is you can't actually make any assumptions about numbers. Now that might sound a little bit confusing, but what that means is if I just have this one microphone sitting out at night, let's say I record five calls in a row that are the same species. Let's say we have a big brown bat, very original name, I know. We have a big brown bat and we have five calls in a row. We don't know if that is five different individuals each calling into a microphone, or if that is the same individual circling, 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 circling. So if you just have a microphone out looking up at the sky, it's stationary, you can't actually make any idea of what numbers. We don't know how many big brown bats are in the park. So what we can do is we can make this microphone move. And that's why I have my microphone attached to the back of my truck right here. Because what we can do that is really cool when you're studying bats is not only can you listen to these echolocation calls, these calls the bats are making echoing off the environment, going back to their ears at pitches higher than we can hear, but we can drive in our car just faster than a bat can fly about 20 miles an hour. And we can drive long distances across a landscape. And if we're going faster than a bat can fly now, when we get five, calls in a row from that big brown bat, we know that each pass, each time a bat passes this microphone and is recorded, it's a different individual. And now we can start talking about numbers. So here in Zion, we are doing our driving transects with this little microphone attached to a PVC pole, attached to the truck, hooked up to a smartphone. And we're learning really amazing information by driving our roads at night and listening to bats. We're able to see how bats differ across a landscape. Because when we drive, everywhere on the route is surveyed evenly. We're going that same 20 miles an hour the whole time. So we're able to see maybe how bats select for different habitat. Maybe some species are more likely to be down by the river. Maybe some species prefer to be out in the drier areas where the canyon's wider. We can also see how bats change, how their distribution changes based on elevation. 
Along our drives, we have elevations that may vary from 8,000 feet all the way down to 3,600 feet. That's a big elevation change. And just like a lot of animals, very different elevations. Example, we have elk and mule deer here in Zion. The elk are only ever at the highest elevations, whereas the mule deer are very abundant here at the lower elevation in our canyon. Different bat species also like different elevations. So here in Zion, we are monitoring our bats with their acoustics. By listening to sounds we shouldn't be able to hear, and by doing that, we are able to make estimates on our populations, estimates on how the populations of bats are changing throughout the year, how their populations are changing up and down in elevations. And we're even able to maybe, if we're really lucky, find out where in these tall cliffs behind me bats are living. So hopefully you might know a little bit more now about how a bat finds its way in the environment, how it uses echolocation to find objects at night, and how we can listen in to better understand the story of our bats, which helps us protect and preserve them. And that is the goal of science, to protect and preserve our animals here. So thank you and have a wonderful day. And when you go out at night, maybe you can see some bats flying around. And even if you can't hear them, just remember, there is a silent symphony above you. Thank you.